Welcome to Embedded. I am Alicia White, alongside Christopher White. We promised a show about Zephyr, and here it is, Zephyr and Nordic at the same time, with our guest, Carles Kufi, here to answer our questions about Zephyr, Nordic, and, I don't know, maybe some other stuff. Hi, Carlos. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Glad to be here. Could you tell us about yourself as if we met at lunch at Electronica? <laughs> sure. So I'm an embedded software engineer. And uh, f- although for the last few years I've been working on open source and specifically on Zephyr, uh, my career has really revolved around Bluetooth, um, really. So I started uh, many years back now, uh, back in 2000, uh, working on what was then to become the first ever uh, hands-free car kit uh, compatible with Bluetooth. So um, it was the first device you could actually uh, install on a car and have your uh, phone connect wirelessly to it. So that was that was pretty nice. It was uh, for me, it was an introduction to a technology that then essentially has um, has been with me for my whole career. Um, not always as my first uh, sort of my, my first uh, <clears throat> area of focus, but uh, usually related to or in very close contact to. And um, so after. Uh, doing a little bit of Bluetooth in uh, in France back then, uh, and after shipping that first uh, hands-free car kit, which was made by a company called Parrot, um, which went on, by the way, then on to uh, to make uh, drones. Um, then I started working on an operating system actually uh, in the UK. This is a company that disappeared, uh, but it was it was a very very interesting company. I will always uh, remember it very fondly. Uh, we're basically doing Android before Android existed. So um, instead of using Linux, we had our own kernel. And then all of the applications were written in Java. Um, so this was 2003, so uh, well before Android. And uh, I, I, we had some really top-notch uh, engineers in there. And uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the startup itself wasn't successful, although we had funding from the mobile operators and we had a lot of support from a lot of people, but ultimately... We didn't succeed, but the code base and in general the uh, what I learned there that's where I got my first um, uh, contact with Linux, Unix, and um, in general with um, uh, the the whole philosophy behind all those operating systems. So this was for me a huge learning experience, and uh, I, I learned to write uh, Unix based code as well as well as learning Java a little bit as well. So this was uh, this was my second big uh, experience, and uh, and one that took me to the most more powerful chip. So away from MCUs, from microcontrollers, and then going to the to the big chips that power the, the mobile phones today. And then I went back to uh, to uh, microcontrollers a, a little bit for a little while uh, in a small startup um, before landing on Symbian. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. system. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you have to be a bit old. Hey. <laughs> it used to power... <laughs> well, I'm speaking for myself. No, no. Uh, so I used, to... <laughs> I used to work at Symbian uh, and... Uh, it was very interesting, actually. They 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 made the operating system that powered the uh, the uh, smartphones of the day, mostly Nokia, but uh, as, as well as a few others. And it was an operating system based around C plus plus and very interesting and intricate concepts uh, from the software development point of view. And it was hugely successful at the time. It had a massive market share, especially because, or maybe related to the fact that Nokia uh, was uh, basically owning that market at the time. And uh, then uh, what happened is that the iPhone appeared. So Nokia scrambled to sort of, at the time, I guess things have, must have changed so much, but at the time they scrambled uh, to try to counter that. Because I remember they even set up a high-speed camera, uh, one of those that can record thousands of frames a second, just to figure out whether the original iPhone's UI was indeed running at 60, 60 frames per second. So they wanted to know whether that was actually technically possible with the technology at the time. And it was. It's just that Symbian never did, right? And we, we never hmm. managed to get to that to the level of fluidness in the user interface. And I, I remember that also as a, uh, as a learning experience that uh, engineers someone, uh, sometimes from another side of the world can surprise you with something that you never expected. So, uh, and... After a while, I'm working on uh, different odds and ends here and there, mobile applications, things like that. I landed at Nordic. Uh, that was 2010, and Bluetooth Low Energy was about uh, to become a thing. Uh, the first version of the specification, I think, was released uh, either late 2010 or early 2011. And uh, 
Nordic wanted a chip, or Nordic had been designing a chip already uh, for Bluetooth Low Energy. In fact, Nordic was one of the promoters uh, of the Bluetooth Low Energy technology, and which was partially based on on some um, earlier Nordic chips. And uh, so I joined the team, the, the team that was making the first ever uh, Nordic Bluetooth Low Energy chip, uh, a very simple chip with an AT51 microcontroller, wasn't even ARM uh, at the at the time. Uh, it was very limited, but we actually shipped in many products, I guess it's safe to say now, on Casio's, Casio watches, not smart watches. I'm talking about the ones with the LCD uh, screens. So they actually sold one, some of those with our chip in them uh, at the time. I think it was called NRF 8001. And uh, the first one we released. And uh, it was a it was a very simple chip, but an interesting one. It ga- gave us a first uh, step uh, or, you know, a f- first foot in the in the market of Bluetooth energy. So that was interesting. And um, after that, I became very involved. I started actually with another person, the soft device project um, um, with several people. Actually, I started with several people, the soft device pro- project. And that is what we did for a long time. Actually, the soft device for those that don't know, I guess, come that uh, not familiar with the Nordic software architecture of the last 10 years or so, which, you know, wouldn't be that surprising, is, was, or is, I guess, if you count that it's still still supported, but no new features uh, come to it, is essentially a binary blob that you flash in Nordic devices, and then you can interact with it via supervisor call. So it's, it's kind of always there, always available, uh, no matter where you are, what you're executing in the chip. So it, it has some uh, very specific and uh, particular properties that you know we, we made sure were designed so that you could have Bluetooth no matter what you're doing in the chip. So if you are updating an image, if you're in the middle of a bootloader operation, you always have Bluetooth available. So it's a bit... Uh, a bit uh, special, but I think it worked It worked well. Uh, this was very well received, and uh, for a long, long time we were supporting it, and uh, uh, well, we still do, like I said. Um, but uh, we, after a while, we saw that we needed something else, so I was uh, indirectly, accidentally <laughs> put in charge of finding a sort of a next uh, generation or, or designing a next generation software development kit for Nordic, for Nordic chips. So well, that's what I've been done for the last, uh, what I've been doing, sorry, for the last few years. It's been mostly working on Zephyr because we chose Zephyr. And I guess I'm sure we'll talk about Zephyr more. So I'm not going to uh, get ahead of myself, but we chose Zephyr for SDK, as most people know now, uh, especially engineers that work with Bluetooth chips. And we've been using it. We've been modifying it. We've been contributing to it. We've been expanding it. We've been doing a lot of things with it uh, for the last, uh, I would say, seven years, I want to say. Um, so, or perhaps even eight. Um, and that's my job today, still now. Um, I mean, I contribute to open source, mostly as effort, but other projects too. Um, I interact with the projects. I act as a, or my team acts as a bridge uh, between the internal Nordic engineers and the open source projects. And we do many, many more things. So that's sort of a summary of my professional career. I'm not sure if that's where you, you were asking, but I kind of got on a tangent when this that's way. That's fine. <laughs> but we're going to do lightning round next, where we ask you short questions and we want short answers. Sure. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Barcelona or Real Madrid? Barcelona. Worst Zephyr macro. <laughs> I'm just going to use the word macrobatics. The, the, <laughs> all the macrobatics in device tree, probably. Although <laughs> I, I, I can't choose. There's so many. <laughs> uh, GDB. Well, GDB is command line debugging. I don't understand the question. GDB or printf debugging? Uh, <laughs> Definitely printf. Best O'Reilly cover animal. Oh, uh, uh, real or fictitious? Uh, I I don't know, honestly. Off the top of my head, I I really don't know. (laughs) You always choose your own cover animal. Oh, that's true. Of course. Yes, uh, I'm really bad at this. Uh, What was it? (laughs) I don't even remember. (laughs) It's been so long and I've had the song in between. Uh, Anyway, uh, yes, uh, I don't don't remember. Uh, What was it? Um... Uh, now I'll have to search it, huh? Because you put me on the spot now. <laughs> you know, it's been a, it's been a long time since then. It has um, been a long time. Yeah. Uh, what is it then? It's uh, oh yes, it's one of. But I don't know the name of the bird in English. Um, do you know it? It's um, it's not a robin. It's it's a jay. Maybe could it be a jay? Um, it would make sense if it was a blue jay. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's probably a Blue Jay. So can I say Blue Jay then? Sure. Yeah, okay. And Blue Jay it is. Would you rather work on applications or operating systems? Operating systems. Complete one project or start a dozen? Complete one project. Favorite fictional robot? <laughs> so I have to say, uh, I, I'm not a big sci-fi fan, but uh, I'm going to say the uh, the robot, the, the female robot, I think she's called Maria, from a film that I really enjoy, uh, Metropolis. Hmm. Oh, that's the, like the original sci-fi film, right? <laughs> sort of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Do you have a tip everyone should know? Uh, use Git Bisect. Uh, no, really, no. Um, <laughs> uh, I know. Um, yes, everybody should know about connecting vessels. I remember when I learned this, blew my mind, like how to pour water using tubes and difference in height. <laughs> connecting vessels. Or get bisect. I don't, I, I don't know. Both are important. They're both good, but only use one with code. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so Zephyr. Um, Chris and I have been getting a crash course in Zephyr after kind of seeing it for a while. Um, but as we're working in Zephyr on multiple platforms, multiple processors, one of which is a Nordic, um, we're coming across a lot of things that are good and bad. Um, do you have, do you have favorite parts of the system? I do. I do actually. Um, the, my favorite parts of Zephyr um, are actually the kernel APIs, I would say. I, I think they're very clean. Um, I've always liked it in, in general, and I've always liked them. I think they were designed... Uh, some people don't think the same, by the way. I'm, I, I'm not... Uh, this is not a widespread opinion, I guess, or at least I haven't... But, but in my particular opinion, and compared to others, and I have had a chance to compare to other uh, kernels, I think they're great. Uh, maybe it's because I'm biased, and I've worked with them too, for too long now. But... Uh, you know, I really, really, really think they are, in general, well-designed and they are very functional, easy to understand. And these are the ones that let you sleep the processor or For example. let you um, send signals. Correct. So uh, among others, they will allow you for a, a sleep for a certain amount of time, yield a threat, take a semaphore, uh, spawn a threat, um, poll, for example, on multiple uh, synchronization objects, and so on and so on. But uh, some of the very... Uh, some of the ones that I think that nailed nailed their use case and have been widely used over and over and over are uh, some of the some of the ones that perhaps are lesser known by the by those starting in Zephyr. The message queue, for example, K message queue. That's a great API. It does um, require you to uh, to incur an, an extra copy, so to speak. But other than that, it's super practical and it's uh, one of the easiest ways you have to pass arbitrary data between two threads. So I definitely recommend uh, people coming to Zephyr to look not only at the ones that are mostly that, that you come across always, um, like KSMTA, KMutex, KThreadCreate, and so on, but actually go beyond those and look at the, uh, at the documentation, which I have to say, in my opinion, the kernel one is very high quality. And look at those extra ones, look at those additional ones that you don't find on every single sample. Um, you actually have to go looking for them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Newcomers to Zephyr uh, is a good good thing to talk about. Do you have do you have suggestions? Um, when I when I started with the uh, NRF fifty three audio DK, I, I know Codex pretty well, so I, I was comfortable with the audio. I know BLE enough to know GATS and and peripherals and all of that. But I didn't know the audio BLE part, which was big. I didn't know Zephyr, which was large, very large. And I didn't know Nordic's Zephyr, which was different. Do you have a good way of getting started without getting lost in any of these rabbit holes? Um I want, I want to say yes, but that would be optimistic. So the, the point is, uh, Zephyr, Zephyr has, has a steep, steep learning curve. That's a fact. I mean, this is this is something we've repeated uh, time over time. And we've tried to mitigate that. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking here, I'm, 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 I'm actually putting my, uh, my Zephyr hat on and then changing it for my Nordic one and so on, then switching them because we've tried on both sides, right? Very hard. And I think we've accomplished some of it um, to help out new users. But um, the, so, so the first thing to know is that 
you need to take it slowly with Zephyr. Um, you need to start with a simple sample, understand perhaps just how a thread is created, how a semaphore is posted, the very basics without trying to understand everything at once. Don't go and looking what's why is there an overlay file here? What's an overlay file? Why is there a <laughs> .conf file here? What's yes. a, you know? So so start with the code, run it, compile it for your development kit. It's almost certain that your development kit or a very close variant will be supported because there's so many boards supported in Zephyr. Really uh, not in NCS, <laughs> but in Zephyr, yes. In NCS, we re- we reduce the number of boards to those uh, obviously uh, uh, sold by Nordic. But the in in and uh, by the way, sorry, NCS means NRF. Connect SDK, which is a Nordics SDK that comes with, Ze- it's not really a flavor of Zephyr, it includes Zephyr. So it's a bunch of things, including Zephyr, and that whole package, which is really a, 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 a large number of uh, Git repos, that whole thing, it's called NRF Connect SDK. And that is uh, what we maintain in Nordic, and that is our software solution for all of our developers. So uh, if we talk about Zephyr, upstream Zephyr, vanilla Zephyr, as people tend to refer. Um, then uh, there's so many boards in there. You can pick your own board or buy a cheap one. You can even use QM or, uh, you know, right. or it, it, you don't even need to buy hardware. The point is you try a little bit. You you you, you add a print case statement. You um, you add, perhaps you add one semaphore and you post the semaphore between two threads and you start playing with that. Now, then slowly you jump into what probably is the hardest part when you start with Zephyr, which is the build and configuration system. They're mm-hmm. really tricky, but they're tricky for a reason. Um, when you have an operating system like Zephyr that supports not only uh, so many different boards, but so many different SOCs, uh, so many different applications. So we go from a 16K of RAM into gigabytes of RAM, right? Because uh, uh, Zephyr actually runs on the on Big Iron as well, right? And some on some some applications, but some some of our com- mem- uh, uh, member companies, some of our of our users actually use Zephyr in very very big chips. But at the same time, you can still build and run Zephyr, uh, including a Bluetooth stack for the BBC Microbit, which is the original version, right? Which is a a, a Cortex M0 with 16K of RAM. So it's, uh, why am I saying that? That's I'm just trying to explain why the complexity is there, right? You could skip some of that complexity by um, essentially compromising on the scalability, compromising on the extensibility. Uh, but if you don't, then you pay a price and the price is complexity. That complexity is there to avoid adding complexity to your application later. So you under, you do need to understand the basic uh, uh, frameworks that allow you then to take your application and be or clo- you know be close to the dream of a rebuild away to switch chips, right? And I can switch then to another vendor. And so and, and, and that's that's why we have things like Kconfig and device tree, which are very complicated. We all agree, which have thousands of entries only in the in the in the in the main Zephyr tree. That's a, let alone if you then use uh, a, an extension of Zephyr, right? Like like the Nordic SDK or 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 anything else. There are many extensions to Zephyr that can be downloaded. So um, the point is, take those slowly um, and try to understand them one after the other. So try, try Kconfig. Um, create your own config, uh, config option, change the values of existing ones, uh, see what happens then in the code. Um, do the same for device tree. Device tree is particularly difficult because it involves you understanding not only the actual device tree source, which is a, a way, a language to describe hardware, which is complicated enough in itself. But on top of that, you need to understand the schema for that, uh, for, for those for those files, which essentially are called is what we call bindings. Uh, those are YAML files that describe what you can write in device tree in device trees, right? So the whole thing uh, is overwhelming. I understand, and I haven't even mentioned the uh, the fact that we use CMake, but we have our own set of CMake APIs that begin with Zephyr underscore. And there's a very valid reason to that that I won't go into today. But <laughs> if you are curious, you can ask around in the community. They will they will explain you why. Right? It's um, so there's a bunch of things that you need to start uh, uh, taking on very, very slowly. Now, there is one series that I really, really enjoyed. And I read it even though I've been uh, working on Zephyr for years. And uh, it's from a company called Memfold. Um, they do very, very good uh, blog yeah. posts. They have... Yes. Uh, yeah, so so they have this um, this this website or this blog called Interrupt, um, and in it they have this series called Practical Zephyr. So I would very very much uh, recommend those. They're very good. Um, I think they, they do a great job at explaining the basics, um, Kconfig, and then Device Tree. It stops there, uh, but they, they do a great job. But of course, also 
Uh, Nordic, you know, we've put a lot of effort into also training, um, training solutions, training, um, training materials. And we have the Deaf Academy, to which I'm happy to say I've contributed myself as well. And, uh, you know, as a, as a technical consultant, so to speak, although I haven't written the content myself. But uh, and I think that that those courses are also absolutely great. The only downside, uh, if you you know, if you call that a downside, is that they're obviously oriented towards uh, Nordic SDK and less so to Zephyr. But there's a lot of content in there that's applicable to both uh, Nordic and Zephyr, right? So Dev Academy, if you're using Nordic, that's, you know, unmissable. You have to, you have to, uh, uh, you have to read it. You have to uh, go through the courses. And if you, if, and no matter what you're using, if you're using Zephyr, be it with Nordic or not, I would very much recommend the interrupt series uh, from Memfold, Practical Zephyr. Uh, that would be what I'd do if I started now. The other thing that I would also absolutely recommend is going to the YouTube channel uh, that Zephyr has. And there's some really great videos there for uh, driver development, for um, device tree as well, Kconfig, the build system. There's, there's all sorts. Um, just search. If you if you sort by views, uh, I'm sure you'll get a, you know you'll get a pretty good feeling of the ones that have been successful. And there's a reason for that. Uh, they, the, the 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 presenters there they did a great job uh, two or three years ago. And and, and it's you know it's pretty well by the way i was re-watching one of them um earlier this uh this month and uh uh those also if you prefer listening or watching to to reading those do a great job at introducing those as well uh, and then finally uh discord please join discord please ask uh questions on discord avoid creating a if you fail to understand something, avoid creating a, 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 a GitHub ticket because uh, that's really not their purpose. Their pur purpose is to contain actual bugs, right? And we've had so many users um, use that for, uh, or GitHub tickets for uh, for questions. Either use the, the GitHub discussions. I don't use them myself that much, but I know they're popular among the community. But Discord, Discord is perhaps the king of real-time communication in, well, uh, I guess in the world almost right now, <laughs> perhaps not, but uh, 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 but definitely for Zephyr. Zephyr, we have a Discord server. It's extremely active. Uh, people help, help each other a lot every day. Every day I see um, dozens of conversations. We have channels for all possible topics um, and I'm very very much recommending joining this Discord server as soon as you start your path uh, 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 of Zephyr discovery. I I I did the Memfault interrupt uh, blog Practical Zephyr. That was really good. Um, Dev Academy. I did a little bit of. I'm more of a reader than a watcher. Um, and Discord. I've been on that Discord for a long time, but it's so noisy that I just kind of forgot about it. <laughs> just <laughs> let the messages pile up and didn't really think about and I was worried that I wasn't sure if my questions were Nordic or Zephyr for a long time. Oh, but that's fine. We have a Nordic channel, right? So you can ask them in the Nordic channel and if they're not uh if they're not Nordic related, perhaps we, we, we I think we you know, I I don't wanna like blow my own horn, but I think we're relatively good at redirecting people to towards the right channels. And it's perfectly okay. okay. Sometimes we get questions about a device tree in the uh, random channel or in the uh Discord channel, which is supposed to be about the Discord uh server itself. So and that's perfectly fine. That's that's all. so so please don't don't hesitate to ask. We we in general, those uh, on Discord trying to help other users, I'm sure we'll will will redirect you uh, properly. And if not, you know, it doesn't matter. Many questions get answered in the in the wrong channel anyway every day, and that's perfectly fine. Well, that's good. I have a uh, UART two DTS question that okay, I will be posting there very shortly. <laughs> All right, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> One of the difficulties I had just on top of I, I didn't find device tree, all that intimidating, maybe because I've seen like things like that before, but the, the, the language of it and how it describes hardware, I, I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a giant macro system. It's what I would have designed. I don't, I mean, under the hood, it's a macro system, but that's not how it appears in the, in the sourcing. Okay. No. Um, but the, the trouble I had most was, okay, yeah, I understand kconfig. Yeah, I understand DTS. It's the hierarchy and the inheritance that happens from board to peripheral to oh. to maybe uh, SOC. So there's all these DTS files that and kind of build on too. each other in the application and walking and f kind of seeing how those flow from one to another throughout the entire source tree, especially when you have a, a complete Zephyr, you know, repo with everything in it. It got very confusing to see, oh, this isn't working because 14 DTSs upstream 
this pin was set to be something else or right yeah right I, 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 it's this is a very not, not only it's a very good point it's one that we've been struggling with for years now the problem is you have to cater for uh, those end users that use Zephyr exclusively to build their own application, and they're mostly worried about their final result, right? So they, they have their application and they have their device tree files, they're bored potentially if they're not using a DK. But then you also need to support this operating system in general, meaning we have to build it against right. a thousand different target uh, combinations and so on. So then it becomes essentially um, a, a compromise or a balancing game between um, let's make it clear where these files come from for users. And that's no easy task, as you've discovered yourself. But at the same time, we have to be so flexible that we, if you want to change um, a single device tree node, you can do it at the SOC level, at the board level, at the application level, or even at the command line level. You know, so And we do that, well, in part, uh, because we think it's the right thing to do from an architectural point of view, so having multiple entry points. But most of all, we do that because we need to. If we didn't do, do that, then we would have to duplicate stuff. And we would end yeah. up with tons of duplicates. And that's the reason, really. Um, but I understand we what we've done to mitigate the issue that you've just described is to try uh, in the different parts of the Zephyr documentation, which I agree could be improved in that regard. But what we've tried to do is have bullet points um, for the sequence of inclusion uh, for device to NK config files. And uh, if you go to that, we have many sections in the application that deal with uh, the documentation that deal with that, but there are two main ones, right? Um, and one is called application development inside uh, developing with Zephyr in the um, documentation, in the main uh, vanilla upstream documentation. Uh, and then the other one is inside build and configuration systems, where especially if you go into the, um, uh, into the um, uh, build system and uh, sysbuild, which is you know, something else we can talk about, uh, they try to make it clear how those uh, how this inheritance works, mm -hmm. not only for, for kconfig and device tree, but also for other files uh, that also um, that, that they're also inherited. So that's the reason, and that's how we try to mitigate it. But I completely agree with you. It's very complicated. And the, the, you can, the, the downside also is that although for those systems, you do get a consolidated view, unique view in your build folder of the whole device tree, once processed, once, you know, massaged, once, uh, uh, once everything has, has taken place. And also the same for kconfig. You can't blame that, right? You can't, you can't git blame that. So you can't know right. who introduced what because that's generated built in. So like you say, I find myself now not seeing my UART output anymore and I have to go and, uh, the, the, either I go to that file, the, the, the consolidated final file in my build folder and look at the notes there, or I have to make an exercise of jumping back and forth between board, SOC, and, uh, and application um, configuration files, configuration overla uh, overlays or uh, overrides in order to find out what on earth happened. And it is difficult. I, I agree with that. Um, it is difficult. Uh, We'll try to improve it. Uh, we we we've always will, but you know I think we have a renewed uh, energy now towards improving this after the introduction of SysBuild as well, which complicates things even more because it's another layer on top of everything else. So yeah, I have a question from a listener, Tim, um, who says Nordic seems to have gone all in on Zephyr over the past few years. What has that process been like? How has it been to go from <laughs> the the SDK? And the soft devices to switching over to this big thing that you don't really quite control. Well, it's been it's 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 been difficult and challenging and interesting and fun. So uh, a whole you know for me personally, this has been a almost uh, you know my my well not all, almost it has been my uh, main project at Nordic for the last uh, few years so uh, for for me personally it's big, it's big, it's been a big part of my life actually uh, not only not only uh, Zephyr itself but actually using Zephyr at Nordic and um, well I think the, the the hardest part honestly that we got uh, through or that we uh, that we essentially overcame uh, not was not too hard but it was um it, it was a matter of convincing internally those that were in charge at the time um, that using open source was not only a good idea, but was also the future. And um, uh, it, it, there, there were a lot 
there was a lot of hesitation at the time. There were internal voices that decried the uh, the, the the effort, decried the uh, the proposal, obviously, and it's normal. And it you know it, it couldn't. It, I don't think it, it would have made sense if it had been any any way else, because you have to uh, understand that 2016 things look very different than what they do now, right? Uh, Zephyr was a newcomer, had just been unveiled. Uh, there were a few, a couple more uh, art dossiers that were mildly mm-hmm. popular, but by no means were taking the world by storm. Uh, bare metal was still the standard, at least for many, or bare metal combined with free artos, uh, but always using um, silicon vendor hulls or similar, right, uh, drivers. Uh, something as wide encompassing as Zephyr, People were afraid of it, right? For many reasons, um, and 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 you know, and honestly, rightfully so. As in, this was a huge bet. Um, so, uh, so what that that the thing is, it surprised me. It wasn't as hard as I thought, and pro- probably because we did a good pre-study. So we sat down and said, okay, look, let's take Zephyr as it was back then, right, 2016, 2017, and let's try things around. Let's buy. Let's build a. A, 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 a small sample with Bluetooth. Let's uh, uh, see see what the state of it is in all its areas, right? Uh, file systems and networking stack and Bluetooth and kernel and drivers and so on and so on. So we did all of that and uh, we documented it thoroughly. But most importantly, I think what we, we said is there's a lot to do, but there's a good foundation. So th- I think we can start from here. So we had a uh, vendor neutral um, backing uh, on the uh, on the side of the Linux Foundation. So uh, you know you, you, we knew we weren't going to be tied to a particular architecture or vendor. The decisions would be taken um, you know by committee. Um, so that was great. Uh, we knew that the code base we started with uh, and that we would start contributing to was already of good quality. We knew that the that there was a focus on test and security, which is something that we really want. In many of these open source projects, security and test, they, you know, they're, they're an afterthought, uh, not in Zephyr. They were, they were there from the very beginning. So then there was a point, you know, <laughs> I, I gave a talk last year um, and I mentioned a, a quote from a meeting. Uh, we, we, we said, uh, at some point someone said, okay, look, we can either wait to see if Zephyr and in general open source in microcontrollers end up happening uh, or we can make them happen. So Nordic is not a huge company, but we are popular. Uh, we make popular MCUs. I think we could make it happen, or at least help make it happen, right? I, I Obviously, it wasn't us who invented Zephyr or started Zephyr, but I thought, you know, we have enough power that I think with our support, Zephyr could become at least more relevant. We, we never, th- I don't think we ever dreamt of uh, uh, how widely used Zephyr has become now, but at the very least, we knew that it could uh, be a, a, a strong player in the world of open source art. So that, that was actually not too bad. The hard part, so coming back to the original question, the hard part was actually moving to a, a, a new development model uh, and making people inside the company work together in a way that was compatible with upstream Zephyr. And at the same time, that we provi- that helped us provide value for our customers because we obviously don't want to be uh, just a, a company that takes some software that's made elsewhere and puts it on some chip. We actually want to add you know, like every other company, so uh, some special sauce here and uh, uh, additional algorithms, features, etc. So maintaining that balance between working downstream in the SDK, working upstream so that we ensured that the Zephyr was a success, that our chips and our boards were usable, um, not only usable, but were actually optimized for Zephyr uh, upstream as well, um, and maintaining that balance and at the same time reorganizing internally so that we would commit uh, to using GitHub to... Uh, Changing the review process to uh, change to, to to dismantling the silos that we used to have in software development and trying to come to all together and contribute to a single code base. All of that was hard, very hard. Uh, the the and that 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 really took a while. Was there anything that you found surprisingly easy? <laughs> <laughs> Aside from convincing everyone, uh, I think the transition to GitHub. I was expecting it to be worse because we everybody was used to um, another uh, code review system, an internal one, and so on. So I was, uh, people actually liked it, you know. And unlike other things that we changed, uh, this this was actually in general very well received. So it surprised me because I thought, oh my, uh, you know, um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get a thousand 
proposals for to use something else for code review. And we did. But but when the, when we said, no, look, we, we're sticking to GitHub just to be consistent with Zephyr and also because we want to, um, uh, uh, because it's simple, it works, everybody uses it, so why not? You know, we didn't really uh, get any uh, pushback. Uh, in the same way that also surprised me, another one that was easy, actually, is uh, the change to the coding style. So we, we changed from uh, an internal coding style we had uh, with the NRF5 SDK and then all our software, really, at the internal coding style, to Zephyr's. Why? Because well, you don't want your customer to have to switch between two coding styles <laughs> yeah. when looking at the code base, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we made this decision. That was surprisingly easy as well. People uh, seem to, if not like, at least adapt very quickly to it. Uh, let me ask another question that turned out to be very popular, although I'm not quite sure how to ask this. Um, let me start with uh, Bluetooth something something Wi-Fi something something release date. What? So, sorry? <laughs> I'm trying to question? lead him into telling me when we're going to have a BLE chip and a Wi Fi ah, chip. Oh, and yeah, it will I be can, released ah, to the market. I see, I see. They're not going to tell you. I They're cannot tell say you that. that. Yeah, I checked. I checked before the interview. I checked. And unfortunately, I cannot share anything that's not on our website already. So uh, I did see also. <laughs> <laughs> question in the in the Google Doc, but unfortunately, I cannot say. Well, we you you we we do. Uh, I don't think uh, it's a mystery that we're a company that makes Wi-Fi chips and Bluetooth chips. That's obviously well to well known to everyone. So I would say it's highly likely that we release one that combines both. When uh, I really don't know. I I don't know myself to be completely fair, and honest. Uh, so so I don't know. <laughs> Jakey Poo suggested the question, how hard is it to integrate Wi-Fi and BLE into one IC? <laughs> what? Is there, uh, I feel like he's trying to... <laughs> Again, leading questions. Very, very clever workarounds to asking the question. Yeah, right? yeah, that's a very clever workaround. Well, look, I'll, 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 I'll tell you from... Because I'm not a hardware engineer, I'll tell you from the software perspective, given the architecture we have now. So um, from the software perspective, it's actually not too hard because Zephyr, uh, and you know, by extension NCS, allows you to uh, enable and disable everything you want. And uh, uh, in general, it's very well tested against running things in parallel and concurrently. So running the TCP IP stack, which is, by the way, the stack we use in our Wi-Fi products today, uh, and the Bluetooth stack concurrently, it, it turns out to be a you know, fairly well-known and, uh, and popular use case already now, so uh, in different chips and combinations with and without Nordic chips. So actually, the, uh, the, the, the software architecture changes, if any, uh, to ensure that both the Wi-Fi stack, which in our, in our case means essentially the higher layers, right? The lower layers actually run uh, typically in a small core uh, within the, the the Wi-Fi subsystem of the chip or whatever. And that's the case for many other vendors as well. But the higher layers combined with the Bluetooth protocol stack, the entire Bluetooth protocol stack, you know, often including both the upper and lower layers, um, they are very easy to, com to combine. And that should not be a big problem. So from that perspective, software speaking from the software side, it's easy, <laughs> or rather, you know, it never, nothing is ever easy, but it's certainly designed for. So uh, then it comes to hardware, but unfortunately, I don't know anything about hardware, or very little. Um, well, then let's go back to software and ask the question uh, from Timon about why NCS exists. I mean, it's hard because Zephyr does so much. But there are also modules, and and you can pull in and out things. Not modules. That was another thing I was going to ask. But never mind. <laughs> there are lots of subsystems. <laughs> why? Why is it Nordic's Zephyr instead of Zephyr's Nordic? Well, he said it's Nordic SDK that includes Zephyr. Exactly. Correct. <laughs> but why isn't it the other way? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very fair question. The the the, the straight answer is. Because when we started, nothing of what you see existed. So n almost nothing of what you see today. The extensibility of Zephyr using Zephyr modules, for example, right? Uh, the uh, the ability, the, the West tool uh, didn't exist even. So uh, although we started gearing up towards developing all of this tooling, uh, changing Zephyr so you could do almost everything out of three, and we did that for two reasons. Uh, we did it for us and for our Customers. Um, when and here, here, when I say our customers, I mean Nordic customers. But I could also say for our users, referring to 
Zephyr mm-hmm. users. So if you're writing an application, the last thing you want is to modify someone else's C file and then have to commit that diff. What you want is to have your files outside in your own repo and use Zephyr and everything else and see as Zephyr, anything else that's uh, provided for you, um, essentially as a big, huge library that you use and then update when you need, but you don't need to touch uh, unless strictly necessary. So we didn't do uh, or Zephyr did not contain NCS because Zephyr at the time did not did not have the ability to do things like that. And when once it did, we still wanted full control. So it's it's really very much there's multiple factors. One is control. Um, why? Well, problem with Zephyr is that it is a community. Not it's not a problem, but the, the but Zephyr is an open source project, and that means that its uh, development it's led by agreement of the different parties contributing to it. Now, we are a hardware company, we sell chips, so there are times when we have to release on time for our customers. So those two are not really compatible. So that's why we have a very lightweight Zephyr fork, meaning we take the Zephyr tree, the main tree, right? And we uh, have our own variant of it, if you want. Um, but it's it's very lightweight. We try to keep the changes in there to a minimum. And instead, we put all the functionality around it. Now, that functionality, for the most part, doesn't overlap with what Zephyr offers. So that means that for the most part, what we're offering there are additional value, is additional value, additional um, uh, additional algorithms, support for hardware, uh, applications, um, extensions, all sorts of things that are useful to users, but to Nordic users. Um, and this is part of the added value that Nordic sees you know, when delivering the SDK. So uh, now, could we do it the other way around? Not really, because even though Zephyr does include now the uh, functionality to extend it in a manner that you don't need to modify the, its, its code, um, it doesn't mean that we would be able to do what we do if we relied on the open source project. So um, that's the fact that we need the control, the fact that we sometimes also do things that are simply not allowed in Zephyr. Until very recently, you couldn't um, you couldn't distribute binary blobs as in pre-compiled libraries um, as part of Zephyr. We, as in Nordic, championed the introduction of it um, with other companies in order to enable vendors not Nordic, because we already had our solution, other vendors to be able to provide their own binary blobs. But in fact, what we do, what we've been doing since the beginning, beginning is to have a special repository where we put our binary blobs. And those are important because on some of those, we can't share the code because perhaps we don't know that that's very common in silicon vendors. You don't own all the IP you have sometimes, right? So you perhaps we can, you can't share the, the code. So you have to ship it as a, as a, as a pre-compiled library. Or in other cases, it's just easier for the user because the pre-compiled library, it's pre-qualified, for example, for threat, right? So you don't want them to have to go over the threat qualification. So you uh, provide a pre-compiled threat stack uh, that they can use and they, have, they can skip that. So there, there are multiple reasons. And until very recently, that wasn't possible with, uh, with upstream Zephyr. So uh, shipping binary blobs was an important thing as well. Then there's all the uh, branding, um, our own documentation, our own uh, extensions, uh, everything like uh, everything that turns or that 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 that, that goes or, or that that's part of the ecosystem, but not part of the software trees themselves. Those are very important as well. And having our own distribution, our own SDK controlled by us, managed by us, released by us, uh, that was also one key sort of one key requirement for us going jumping headfirst into open source. Um, so there's all of that. Uh, will that change in the future? I don't have a crystal ball. Um, you know, I don't know. But, the, 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 but how we do it today was a logical sequence of uh, decisions uh, based on what was there at the time, what we wanted to give our users, and the uh, approach we took. So, yes. Is that something that, you could foresee reversing in the future when Zephyr becomes capable enough that it makes more sense to go the other direction? It's a good question. And, uh, you know, uh, it's it's one that I really don't have an answer for. Um, not in the short term. Yeah. Not in the short term. There's too much in NCS. There's too much in our SDK. Right. That it's uh, not... not there's, that, that's one, there's one one additional factor that I mentioned that I will add now for, com- for completeness and full understanding of this, that some of our source code, it's actually not open source. The one we ship in our SDK, uh, although 
good parts of it are shipped as source code. The license we use um, have is essentially a modified uh, BSD license where we add um, where we add a clause saying you can only use this software with Nordic chips. Right. This is quite common um, in other SDKs from other vendors, but you cannot call this open source because it's not part. That license is not in the list of OSI approved licenses. So that means that uh, we couldn't contribute that code to to Zephyr directly if we wanted to. We would have to change the license, which potentially we could, but do. Does uh, Nordic as a company want to do that? That would fall on you know uh, people above my pay grade that decide this sort of things. I don't think, and now they've decided not. They want to keep the value added and use that that license, which I think makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you look at the amount of things we've contributed to Zephyr um, uh, uh, so far, and the ones we plan to contribute as well, uh, to keep a little bit for ourselves, you know, it's always a hard. A hard balance because yes, the company needs to make money. On the other hand, we want to say open source and we want it to mean open, open source, not mostly open source. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Yes, and and it, it's very hard. Um, this this is this is actually going back to the earlier question. It was one of the hardest parts is to just decide like for every new um, module framework sample, does this go up or downstream? Right, we have to make a call for that. And we have our own internal processes for that so that uh, we all agree within Nordic um, to an approach to going up and down, and then we act accordingly. But it is hard sometimes because you don't, th- there are risks with doing things down downstream. For example, a competitor of the same functionality may appear upstream and suddenly uh, we have two implementations of the same thing. That's a problem, right? Of If you keep it downstream. But at the same time, uh, certain things that certain um, functionality specifically that we know um, gives us value when compared to other uh, silicon vendors, we want that uh, to be part of NCS and not usable with other chips just because it makes sense, right? In that regard from a uh, from a, um, a company perspective. So there's this walk line you have to, uh, there's this, sorry, there's this uh, fine line you have to walk uh, where you want the project to be successful, you, the, the Zephyr project, you want as m- as many contributions as possible so that you ensure that. Uh, you want also to remain um, optimized and compatible upstream. And at the same time, you have to save something for uh, the SDK. But over years, I, I, I like, or I'd like to think, or I think, uh, uh, my opinion at this point is that we've refined the process so much that it's pretty clear uh, by the moment we conceptually come up with an idea and say, we need to do this, where it's going to go? Because we know each other pretty well now. And, um, you know, uh, every, everything that touches, that, everything that's a big system ends up upstream, right? Because we can't start modifying all of our files in, you know, in a direction that's incompatible with upstream. But, and that makes sense because it's the only sensible approach. And then individual features, individual samples, things that are not, that are more self-contained, that that, 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 that encapsulate a particular feature or, or extra uh, functionality, those typically stay downstream. And you work almost entirely on open source. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> go on, one. sorry. I mean, to the extent that, that, is, that we've been discussing that it's open source. Um, exactly. That's really cool that you you get to work on open source and get paid for it, um, which is, you know, good. Has that become a core part of your next job? Like, I'm not saying you're leaving Nordic. I have no no information, <laughs> no reason to think that. Stop panicking, Nordic folks. <laughs> um, but having worked on open source code, is that something you think is important for your career or do you think it's just one step it's just programming and it's no it's absolutely it's a, a let me put it this way i don't think i'd go, I'd go back to only proprietary source, uh, source code it's fine to have some proprietary source code it's fine i i, I absolutely think that combining proprietary and, and open source software is the right thing to do in in some occasions i think that companies um uh, do it for a purpose that makes sense and i'm you know i'm all in in that but uh, only proprietary, not using uh, an open source project as a foundation. I don't think I could go back to it now. Perhaps uh, there's many reasons, but the main one I think is the the fact that working with open source allows you to meet so many talented dev- and you know this may sound a little bit like a cliche, but it really is true. I mean the 
sheer number of people that contribute to Zephyr. Uh, the different companies, the different coding styles, the different approaches, the different backgrounds, all of that, you know, gives you a, a, a it basically enriches you in a way that I think working in an office uh, with a few developers would never give you. So it, there's that. And then there's the fact that um, I enjoy open source as a philosophy. I, I actually think it's a very good philosophy and a, a very good way of, de- of developing some beyond all of the uh, political or, you know, uh, it, it just think it's a very smart way of developing software. So, uh, so much so that I think it would be a mistake not to use that way, that, that this mechanism, this, this, this approach nowadays, um, especially for complex software. And software on microcontrollers have become, has become so complex that you either do it with open source, uh, in a sort of collaborative manner among all the vendors, or you end up with a clutch. What, what, what would have happened? We would have we would end up with a clutch, uh, mismatch, mix match of, of of different open source projects in part, proprietary uh, modules uh, all together tied with you know with string probably if we didn't have Zephyr. I mean, right? Because there wouldn't be a a, a, a unifying factor. Uh, Zephyr gives you that central point where embed TLS integrates with trusted firmware M. All of these additional. Uh, MCU boot, all of these additional satellite, I want to call them projects, perhaps not the, the greatest work, but they are, they, they are satellites to, to Zephyr and the, all of those work together because Zephyr tests them together, right? And we ensure that those work together. If we didn't have that, uh, I, d- I don't even want to think what the code base would look like, to be honest. Uh, I don't think it'd be good. Uh, I might be wrong, but, uh, so going back to the question, absolutely, I would not, I don't think I would go back to working on proprietary software exclusively. I will, if I ever change jobs, Again, not in my plans. Um, I would definitely uh, go for open source, definitely. How does Zephyr test all of the different boards? Is there some Zephyr room that has a thousand <laughs> tiny mi- microcontrollers? No, not really. Um, the way the way it's been, it, it's this has changed over the years. The way it's done now, essentially, is that all of the CI of the continuous integration in Zephyr happens uh, only by building um, samples and tests and running them on servers, meaning on QMO or native SIM. Uh, this ex- ex- additional mechanism that allows you to compile Zephyr into a Linux application that then can be executed natively on any um, on any computer r- r- running a Linux distribution. Uh, all of that happens on servers, servers that are maintained by the project. Um, actually, we actually have our own servers um, since, you know, I think for a, we've had them for a, for a year or so now. Um, and uh, But that's it. We don't have uh, test farms or, you know, we do have them in the individual vendors' labs, of course, and that's essentially what we do, right? So uh, the individual vendors run the same test suits that are used um, in the uh, emulated or simulated platforms, uh, they execute those on their own uh, in their test lab. So Nordic, for example, has a daily, uh, I think two daily builds uh, that take the latest effort, the latest and greatest, um, and they run it on our boards, uh, only on our boards, of course. And then every time we find a bug, we report it. And that uh, happens with other vendors as well. Um, so that's the way it works. It's essentially people uh, pull their results together uh, using the, the GitHub issues. Um, then we fix those issues as they come. Uh, but the actual execution on hardware is done by the silicon vendors, not by the project itself. So that means that it's completely optional as well, of course. So some silicon vendors do it, some don't. Uh, of course, it's in your interest as a silicon vendor to do it because then you ensure that there's no regressions on your uh, particular hardware. But of course, that depends on your involvement on the project. Okay, so audio DK. No, sorry. (laughs) I've been working on the Nordic NRF audio DK and it has a lot of examples and applications. And I don't want to ask you about those because I understand that's not your area of expertise. But Zephyr as a whole has so many examples. Which is great. Except for the part where none of them do what I want and they're all (laughs) so different that I can't figure (laughs) out what it was I was supposed to do. Yes. How do I untangle those? I mean, I'm an experienced embedded software engineer. I feel like I shouldn't have to read the code 10 times just to figure out whether or not it's using a, a ring buffer. I say that as though I pulled that out of nowhere, but it was a discussion <laughs> recently. Or, or what was the 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 button? Uh, we had a discussion recently about Zephyr and button handlers, and the the person we were talking to 
I was complaining it didn't have a button driver, but it does. But it does. But then I read that button driver and it didn't do what he wanted. So oh, I see. I see. Examples, good or bad? <laughs> uh, you know, we had the same problem in our previous SDK, and I think uh, many SDKs have them. Because when you when you set out to uh, develop something for your users, but you have an operating system that has, I don't know how many thousands of K-config options and, you know, how many modules, framers, etc., like how how do you do it? Like this, uh, I can tell you what we did in in, in Nordic to in order to make it easier uh, uh, for our customers to try not you know hit that wall where there's just too many samples, each doing an individual small uh, task or accomplishing uh, a goal. But then it makes it really hard to put together. It's, what we did is we divided uh, the samples into samples and applications, and then they're basically two categories, right? So the samples are samples. So they're testing or they're showing you how to do one particular thing. So this will be, for example, a BLE throughput sample where it connects two boards uh, and then it sends data as fast as possible. And that's a sample because typically you wouldn't, you'd never ship that, right, in a product <laughs> unless you want, just want to show off uh, how slow uh, Bluetooth is in general with low energy when compared to Wi-Fi especially. So you wouldn't do that, so that's a sample. But then we have applications. Those are actually close to what you'd call reference designs in hardware, right? It's essentially, they're, they're more tested. They include fully featured, uh, you know, applications in the sense they have firmware update, they combine multiple subsystems. Um, they, they, we, we uh, actually execute them in, in some cases in specific, in specially designed hardware. So like the audio decay, for example, right? The audio decay is designed for that application. Um, and that application is essentially the only one that runs on that hardware. We have a, a, a similar one called NRF desktop that uh, showcases how to do a mouse and a keyboard uh, using Bluetooth Low Energy and, and, and NCS effort. So um, that's how we approach this. I think it's not a bad approach and I, I like it personally. Um, and I think it gives users a starting point. But what happens if you... If your future application doesn't fall into the category of the ones or, or to any of the, uh, uh, doesn't match any of the ones we offer, right? Then you're back to square one, like in Zephyr, where you have to pick a sample and start, you know, banging away uh, uh, your code and trying to figure out how to put together all these things together. I think that uh, at least, at least uh, with Zephyr, you get the easy enablement side of things. So you can take, um, uh, uh, with a K-Config option, you can enable a subsystem and relatively easy, uh, easily add functionality to an existing sample. But that said, uh, that still falls short. I agree. The thing is, I don't have a magical solution because we still need samples to test uh, things beyond tests, we still need samples. Even for ourselves, when when we're developing, we need samples. That's what we use. Uh, and not only tests, we, we use samples very often. Um, they're also a good starting point for some applications, uh, but inevitably you're going to hit that that wall of too many samples uh, and then not them not being useful for anyone. I'm afraid I don't have a great solution to the problem. Um, but like I said, you can mitigate it. You can mitigate it. Um, perhaps this could be a you know something we discuss in the we have, we have many meetings in in Zephyr where we uh, especially in during you know in person uh, conferences where we meet and sit down. And this is actually a great topic to to that we could discuss there how to improve uh, the sample situation in Zephyr where uh, there's too many and n n perhaps not complete enough. Um, yeah, there are sometimes multiple ways to do things which is understandable given the organic nature of Zephyr, but it's hard for new people to see the trade-offs. And so if there was a canonical solution, sometimes it would be better. Hmm. It would. Uh, I agree with that. I've, I've experienced that myself where I've seen basically two different samples or tests solve the exact same problem using a different kernel primitive, for example. And that's, the problem is that um, you have developers who are very often very creative, very smart, and they want to try things out. And at the same time, you have uh, users, which probably at that point in time, uh, they just want to get their stuff running and, you know, they they want to boot up their board, bring it up uh, and, and, and do whatever they need to do with that, um, uh, uh, with that firmware. So, it's difficult uh, uh, because the, the the you need flexibility, and at the same time, you don't want to be able to do things in a thousand different ways. But if you've ever programmed in Python, for example, it suffers from <laughs> much 
much of the same, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I was actually writing some Python code this afternoon. I said, I can do it in a thousand ways. I can, I can either iterate or I can use a set or I can... And I ended up going for one of them, but I thought, I don't really know if there's an inherent advantage to one of these. It just, I think the moment you give people flexibility and freedom, you hit that, right? You hit that and it's very hard to, uh, to avoid. Um, I think the, the best thing to do in these cases is to look at a code that you consider of good quality, be it Zephyr or not. Not all of the Zephyr samples are going to be of the same quality, but if you see them, some of them referenced uh, again and again and again, uh, or if you like the way a particular contributor does things. That's quite actually quite often the case. We have people that like other people's contributions. So uh, if you do that, then I think that's also a good starting point to, uh, to try and select how to achieve one particular thing. That's funny. I didn't think about that. I mean, I remember in college having favorite teachers, but I don't, I don't ever really think about looking at who writes the code. Why have I never thought about that? <laughs> well, I, I do. I do have a few actually in upstream Zephyr, and and, and that's obviously I'm not going to get name names, but uh, uh, you end up kind of perhaps you have a, a a mind that is more alike. Um, so you you tend to select the same uh, the same resolution to uh, to a particular problem. Maybe it's just because the way they write their code uh, is also, from your perspective, the uh, the ideal or the optimal way. Because very often you're mistaken about that. We are all mistaken because you try something out, then you actually look at the assembly code in the in the in the list file and or or, or anywhere in the listings, and 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 it's just not nothing at all what you expected. And the compiler has done something completely different, and then your uh, assumptions about what was better optimized uh, completely fall through. But having some people that you trust how they code and that you agree when they take uh, technical decisions, I think it's uh, it's something that's definitely worthwhile. Hmm. Well, the temptation to ask you to name names is very high, but I don't think that would be prudent. <laughs> I really don't want to, uh, to, to, to name preferences here. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carlos, it has been really great to talk to you. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yes. Um, uh, in line with uh, one of the questions that um, that mentioned or uh, that was asking, was it hard or not to transition from a proprietary um, development model entirely to then switching to uh, a, a one that's based on open source that contributes to open source that uh, radically changes the way software is developed in a in a particular company? Uh, at that at one thought that I'd like to share with uh, listeners is. The fact that you see uh, how things are done and uh, that there's an established approach to solving problems in a company, I don't think that's always uh, a reason to abide by it. So I think that sometimes uh, things around you, and when I say around you, I mean in the industry, um, you know, uh, among your peer programmers that might not work at the same company, uh, change. Things change, things evolve. And not everybody in your company or not everybody uh, um, working with you may be on board with that. But uh, I think it's very important to make your voice heard if you think that a company could do better. I'm not even t talking about mistakes. You know, everybody makes mistakes and that's always great to point them out. But those are usually very, very often pointed out very quickly uh, in a company. What's harder to point out is the general direction. If you think that the general direction a company is going, uh, and I'm not even talking about Nordic now, I'm talking completely in general. This is, uh, if you see that the way your company is doing things, technically, of course, is not in line with what the uh, with what the world, with the direction of the world, the end, you know, the, when I say the world, obviously, I mean, uh, uh, the, the technical, um, uh, the technical community is going towards, then I think it's very important to speak out. Uh, not because you want to be the person that has, uh, you know, uh, changed the way things are done in a company. But because if you don't say so, you're actually harming the company <laughs> from my perspective. Because if you know something or you think you know something that's going to be, a, you know, a, a deal breaker or a major change or something that's going to uh, completely overhaul uh, how things work in your industry and you don't mention that, right, then it's, it's sort of like holding... Holding out on on the rest, and it's uh, you may end up uh, not only harming the company, harming yourself in the sense that you will not be able to develop uh, the software you always wanted to. You 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 will not be able to see your products uh, succeed, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, even if you have to go to the CTO, you know uh, uh, what what's the worst you can the worst you can happen if you suggest uh, going in a particular direction is 
perhaps uh, you will, you know, will have wasted a few moments of someone's time. But at best, you know, you can actually change the way uh, a, a company approaches technical uh, challenges. And it might well be that one day, you know, you will find out that that was the right thing to do. And then you'll probably be happy for it. So that's that's sort of the parting thought I wanted to to share with you. Thank you. That was good. Our guest has been Kyle's Kufi, open source software engineer at Nordic Semiconductor. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you to Christopher for producing and hosting. Thank you to our Patreon listener Slack group for their questions. And of course, thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on Embedded FM, which is where the show notes will be, which is what will contain links to things like the Memfault Practical Zephyr Introduction and Nordic's Dev Academy and all of that. And so now I have a quote to leave you with. I mean, the problem is once you start on Don Quixote quotes, you really just tune out for the podcast so that you can look, read Don Quixote all over again. Um, so let's go with this one. Finally, from so little sleep and so much reading, his brain dried up and he went completely out of his mind. Alternatively, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, which I didn't know where that came from, but apparently Don Quixote. Don Quixote.